Well, welcome everyone to Friday night's Bible study, which we are continuing our study on the book of Revelation, chapter 13. We really didn't, it's pretty much a takeoff point at this point because we've been stuck in Revelation chapter 13, verses 1, and dividing that. But what we have been doing is really trying to bring out step by step in simple terms our understanding of Revelation 13. So last week I did go through some historical things. If you haven't seen that video, please go see. I posted it online. So the historical beliefs that have surrounded the Revelation chapter 13 and those uh, beliefs had to do with the two positions in theology of preterism and futurism. So you are either one in one camp or another camp or the other camp. So I did explain to everyone last week that there were two camps. And if you were in the preteristic camp or the full preterism, or they call it partial preterism as well, that basically stated that all prophecy is done. Israel has fulfilled all those prophecies in 70 AD. And there are no more prophecies to be fulfilled. Israel is now the focal point of everything. So out of preterism and full preterism, we find that there have been heresies that have emerged even today. And I'll quickly go through those things as well to, tonight. So that was full preterism. Then we have futurism, which states that there are prophecies that still need to be fulfilled. And Israel, while it's a focal point in the tribulation, there are things that have to be fulfilled in terms of what dispensationalists have positioned and have identified as the church age and all those church age doctrines that revolve around the return of Jesus Christ for the church. So it's those things that I went through last week. And if you, again, if you're not up to scratch with that, please have a look at that video from last week. It's online on YouTube. But again, we are taking our time trying to, with just incrementally going through this chapter, it's so packed with things and so deep that to surface read it and to surface study it, we will miss the blessing because there is the blessing, as you know it, since our beginning study of Revelation, there is a blessing that comes from studying this book. And this book is all about the Lord Jesus Christ to his glory and honor and praise. So Revelation 7, verses 3, 7 to 13. I just want to just pause everyone, and I want to bring some encouragement to everyone right now because we're at a really critical juncture at this time. Whatever's going on in the body of Christ, it is going on very rapidly as we see the signs and we see the great indicators of the end of the age. At the end of every dispensation, it ends very bad. It ends poorly. It ends with judgment, and it's not good. End of every dispensation. And from what I can see from my chair is as I look at prophecy, as I look at the indicators around the world, both in news, socially, uh, uh, politically, in terms of the financial status of the world, all the things that we have been talking about, it just doesn't look good, and it's going to get worse as we know it. And But I want to bring some encouragement to everyone tonight because there are words in the, the book of Revelation as well as throughout the, all of Scripture that brings us encouragement and that we need to really take care of business in this sense because the word says this, and to the angel of the church of Philadelphia, the church of Philadelphia, the church of brotherly love, we've already gone that. We've already done this study. And it's a study about the typology of the church, which is during the church age. This is a, a time section or a, or a historical part of the church age. However, in the tribulation, this is actually a church which will exist in the tribulation. So, But there are things in it that we can take to heart. And these things, it says here, these things saith he that is holy, he that is true, and he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works, 
Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength. The church right now, and even yourself, you might have a little strength. You might be going through some tough times. You might be going through some times where, you know what, I just don't have any strength anymore. There is nothing that compels me to do things. Thou hast a little strength, yet here is the declaration from the true witness, from the Lord Jesus himself. You have kept my word. Thou hast kept my word, have not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. That's a really important text to, un to unpack. Verse 10, I want you to just to put your eyes and focus on. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, the word of my patience, I will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Keeping the word of God's patience. There is patience in keeping the word. And what's next straight after that? Behold, I come quickly. Behold. Hold fast, which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. And that's the, that's the really a reference there. And if we could look at it, it's a typology that before the rapture, we really need to keep God's word in the word of his patience. Because there is a time, it's called the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Because the next instance in verse 11, you find here's the rapture coming. And whilst there is this theme running in this text concerning the, the return of Jesus Christ during the tribulation, uh, the mid-trib, we've gone through that. Here is a promise to the church age that he'll come quickly because it's almost that time sequence. Behold, I come quickly, hold fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. And that's something that many in the body of Christ now are facing. It's a question of, do I really, do I really want to compromise my crown for the very things that are going to compromise? And that is doctrine. How do I do that? Second Timothy 4, verses 3 to 5. Here's the, here's the warning that Timothy gives to the church. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. That is what is needed today. Sound doctrine, because the word of God is four things, remember? Doctrine is given for doctrine, the word of God. But after their own lust shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Have you seen people with itching ears? I have. As soon as the truth comes, they actually start rubbing their ears because they've had enough of listening to it but they've had itching ears and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned under fables. And those fables and heresies and those doctrines of devils that are coming and that are now saturating the church are here. They're here already, but watch thou in all things and your afflictions do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of your ministry. For everyone who's wanting to be founded on God's word, we need to make full proof of the ministry of the word of God. But Philippians 3, 17 to 19 tells us this. Brethren, be followers together of me and mark them which walk so as you have us for an example. For many walk. And here we go. Paul is talking about what's going on in the church. And this has been an issue with the church for nearly two millennia. Is that we have men seeking to divisively and these so-called quote unquote preachers of righteousness but they're actually come as angel of light just like the devil comes as an angel of light so his apostles come as an angel of light and starts to draw away disciples after them for many walk of whom i have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of christ verse 19 whose end is destruction or perdition whose god is their belly that's money all those things whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. And what do you see here? You see what's going on. This is just a tip of the iceberg. We just, we've already seen some of these things. But what was going on in the Ashbury revival, you've seen it. I've seen it. The first time I saw it, I thought, okay, we've really just jumped into false doctrine now. For the most part, all these things, the Ashbury revival, people have said, yes, it's the work of God. I've always asked the question, 
even in responses, show me the scripture, where is the work of God? See, the, the word of God needs to be the very focus and the very heart and soul revival, the word of God. You see, the word of God points out sin. The word of God challenges us that we need to live godly in Christ Jesus. And so all these things where you see all these people just going through and lining up and queuing up, thinking that and believing, sincerely believing and deceitfully being deceived, that this is the work of the Holy Ghost. But this is this, to me, it's just another repeat of many things. For example, the Toronto Blessing back in 2000 and 1999, 2000. But you have all these guys like Kenneth Copeland, you've got uh, Bill Johnson, all are from the different foundations of their, their religion and their doctrine. Copeland with the Word of Faith movement, he's just one of them. Many of those who literally preached just things that are not only unscriptural, but they are totally things that make the sinner and the flesh, those who are saved in the church, they make those people, those Christians, comfortable. That there is no need for change. There's no need for repentance. There is no need for godly living. So we have all this deception running. And oh, Bill Johnson, this, that's enough to say for this fellow. And so all these things that are coming throughout the church, we see all these heresies and all these uh, false doctrine, these movements, and people, i just never seen the like of it. People without discernment are just being drawn in all those things and being sucked in. That's why I encourage everyone tonight, stick and stay charged and stay cemented, if we could put it that way, in God's word. The latest one, I shouldn't say the latest, has been around for some time, but this Israel-only doctrine, it's a heresy that's now permeating the body of Christ. We've got people who came in, took the tools, if I could put it, took the tools of dispensation and literally took it and weaponized it to cut the church out of the church age, out of it, cut the Gentiles out and put the nation, literal physical nation of Israel as the only focus today and ever since 70 AD. So we have this movement going on and there is no, basically Gentiles need not apply to this doctrine. This is all about Israel and this Israel only doctrine is now slowly and methodically permeating through the belief system of the body of Christ. And you have now Christians who are now their comfort and their hope, no longer in the gospel of Jesus Christ, but in a hope that somehow by their works, and hopefully they'll be able to be resurrected to go into a kingdom that's for Israel only. There is no church. There is no rapture of the church. There is no anything that has to do with Gentiles. And so, again, won't go uh, into it, but the very fact that this, these doctrines are permeating the church, again, brings to this truth that what we need to understand. What we really need to understand is this, that truth there. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of truth. If there's anything that we need to do is hold these things very clear in our hearts and in our study. And what I want to do is that this, the scriptures is a sword. The Bible says that the, the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. It's a sword that has two sides to the blade. And if I could put it this way, when you understand rightly dividing, there is the one side of the sword is the kingdom of God. It's all about spiritual. It's the church, the body of Christ, and the kingdom of God goes to heaven. It's heavenly. And so there are things that in the word of God that are designated doctrine for the church. And that church doctrine is precious to us because Paul the Apostle is the apostle to the Gentiles. He's the apostle of the 13 books that he, he composes. That composition is directed to the church. And it's really important to understand that there is doctrine for us. Now, you've got the doctrine. 
the deity of Jesus Christ, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, the doctrine of salvation. you got the doctrine of hell. All these things come through that because the kingdom of God also covers the things that the Lord Jesus Christ, while he was here, whilst he was there for Israel, there are things that broadly go and even meticulously go to the body of Christ. You've got to study that. And throughout all the Old Testament, there are doctrines that are doctrinal, that are in the Old Testament, that is for the body of Christ. So we moderately divide those things. We don't cut it up too, too detailed. That's what we call hyper-dispensation. And that's what gets in, a lot of people into a lot of trouble. We moderately dispense and we moderately divide to see what the doctrine is and whether or not it is for the church or is it mostly for the nation, literal, visible, physical nation of Israel? So you've got this one side of the blade, which is the kingdom of God. And we went through that study, that study which talked about the kingdom of God, the crowns, the two crowns, there's two crowns, one of the kingdom of God. And the other one is the kingdom of heaven, which is the physical, literal, visible kingdom promised to Israel. And that is all throughout the Old Testament and all through the later parts from Hebrews, to Revelation, and we know that Acts and Hebrews are bookends. They're bookends, they are transitional books. Acts is essentially the uh, the Old Testament uh, being trans transitioning to the New Testament, or I should say to the church, from Israel to the church. Then you have the book of Hebrews, which is transitioning from the church to the tribulation. So all those things are really important, but all those things require us to study. So those things are so important as we look. And so I'm just encouraging everyone just to be mindful that there are things in the that are happening in Christianity right now, including those things we talked about, where premillennialism, the pre-tribulation rapture, these doctrines are now becoming the source of a legal confrontation from the authorities. The authorities or legal authorities of this country are now taking offense to the doctrines we hold dear the pre-tribulation rapture the pre-millennial reign of jesus christ for a thousand years israel is the head of the nations the church is there with the lord jesus christ and they take offense to that there are so many things that are mounting up against christianity that it is possible and it is probable if i could put it this way that when the rapture takes place of the church and the church is caught out, Christianity will become just like it did during the time of the Roman Empire, where Christianity was called a religio illicita, an illegal religion. And the empire, the Roman Empire, hunted down Christians as they did. And so you have the Christians being hunted down. And you know the history of the Christians. You need to re read Fox's Book of Martyrs, all those books, you know, the Reformation, Again, those that persecution was just carried on through the inheritors of the Roman Empire, which is the Vatican. We did all that history, the history of the, the Reformation, all the many saints who were literally burnt at the stake, including go back to history straight after when Christian or straight after the fall of Rome, you find the Christianity becoming a legal religion under Nero and under Vespasian and Domitian. You find these emperors just slaughtering Christians. It was almost daily, just a bloodbath. Christians being basically tarred and lit on fire. Christians being fed to the lions. Lions were made hungry. They were starved. Then they threw the Christians there during the gladiatorial sports. And there they were sacrificed basically to Saturn. So Saturn was the, the god of which the gladiator games were based on. So... Again, just a bit of history, but we want to concentrate on Revelation 13 as we move on, because here in this chapter, there is going to be a slaughter, and it's not pretty. Revelation chapter 13 is not pretty in terms of the tribulation in which we are in. We are in Daniel's 70th week, based on Daniel chapter 9, verses 26. So the, basically, I went through the overview of Revelation 13 last week, 18 verses, in the chapter now it composes of three major divisions i'm going to show you this there are three major divisions in the chapter 13 of revelation and the first 
division is the beast, then followed by the second division, which is captivity and death, and the last division is the second beast. So there are three major divisions, but within those divisions are also subdivisions, and we need to also, again, apply rightly dividing the word of truth, a dispensational method of just understanding what the context is, who the audience is, is it literal, is it myth, uh, metaphorical, is it representative of something, all those things, or is it all together? we just got to find out and determine what is the text saying to us according to what is read, the mark of the beast, number 4666. So we went through that last week, and I'm just going to give you, just, uh, I'm not going to read all this because I, I did this last week, just to give you the the overall picture of the chapter. Here we got from chapter, from verse 1 to 8, that's the first division. From verses 9 to 10, this is the second division, and there's a divide, dividing line there between the first and the third. This is like the, if you put a blade in it, this is the dividing line. And I'm going to go through that as we move along in this chapter. Then the last division, or I should say the third division, is all about the second beast. And it's all about that 660 and 6, 666. Six, six. And we'll be looking at that as we really get into the detail of this whole chapter. But let's go back. And I think we we only covered maybe just a little bit of this. I'm just going to review this as we go along. And it's Revelation 13, 1. I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of of blasphemy so let's concentrate on this on this verse let me review and summarize from last week so we only got up to the first part and i stood upon the sand of the sea comma that's the first bit that we actually finished with didn't go any further we didn't talk about the beast rising up out of the sea or did we i think we might have we might have gone up to the second part of that comma before the comma but the two elements there but we identified the chapter blends okay this is what we identified last week we identified that it blends metaphoric symbolic and literal aspects of the text in these descriptions this is this description here 13 one one needs to rightly divide taking into consideration the context okay we, we looked at that what was the context of the text the context in this instance okay and here's the context because john is seeing this but he's also in the spirit, Revelation 4.2. That hasn't changed. Since John went up in Revelation 4.2, he's been seeing all these things and told to write the things which he sees. And even though he might see things, some voices or, or warnings come from a voice, maybe uh, from heaven, from the thunders, and they'll tell him, don't write the things. So the instruction is very clear to John. The other part there was that John was standing upon the sand of the sea. Now, I know we're trying to get details here. I'm just trying to give you just something just to grapple on. It says that John is standing on the sea. Well, he is standing on what sea? When you do a study on the sea, it doesn't tell you what sea it is. Most scholars and expositors and prophecy teachers automatically assume it is the great sea or the Mediterranean Sea, which is not far off the coast, the west coast of Israel, Lebanon, all those areas. But it doesn't tell you what sea. However, there is one sea that is frequently ignored, and that sea is known today as the Dead Sea. However, the King James Bible, okay, it's known as the Dead Sea today. I actually try to find why it's called the Dead Sea, but it's called the Dead Sea because nothing lives in it except some amoebas and different species of organisms, all those kind of things. But Fish, yeah, no, you, you could throw maybe a cot in there or maybe some goldfish. They'll just die instantly. But you can go floating there in the Dead Sea. But we're going to go through those things as we, we keep marching along in this text. But the King James Bible, according to the King James Bible, the sea that is known as the Dead Sea is also known as the Jordan. That's interesting, isn't it? We went through that last week because that word Jordan has a lot of charge to it. There's a lot of things to unpack from that. So while the scripture mentions the Jordan 179 times, 
it never provides a description of the type of body of water when referring to the Jordan. It never does that. It doesn't say the Jordan River or the Jordan Creek or the Jordan Tributary. It just says, or the Jordan Waterhole. It just says the Jordan. So whenever you went, you read the scripture, it says, I went over the Jordan. It could have been the sea. It could have been the river. But the Bible never specifically tells you which part it is or which, which, which is it. It simply states it as the Jordan. This guy, Ron Pit uh, Ryan Peterson, he's amazing, amazing book. I finished this book. It's all about the judgment of the Nephilim. And what is interesting about R Ryan Peterson's book, which I went through last week, was that Ryan Peterson identifies the Jordan as a gateway. Portals, they are gateways of many supernatural events in Scripture. If you go to the Old Testament, you'll find all these events, including the uh, translation of Elijah, the prophet to heaven. You have all these wars, battles, and things that just go crazy at the Jordan. There is something going on at the Jordan that seems to be highly charged with water, and the Jordan seems to be that area where these things take place. For example, the baptism of the Lord Jesus Christ, God. The Godhead is there. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The whole entire Godhead is at the Jordan. You've got to remember that. So it's water. And it says that these supernatural events in Scripture, that that assessment has incredible validity given that water, that's water, the sea and the sea seem to be connected with these highly charged areas in the world. So there seems to be something about water that provides this charged area or some sort of gateway to the other side or to another realm, to the spiritual realm. But what is also interesting, if you go today and you study all these mounds, now I haven't got a picture of these mounds, but you go to a North America and South America, there are all these mounds, including England, of all things, and Europe, and I think in Africa as well. And I'm not sure about Australia. I'm not sure about that. But there are places where these great mounds and these great structures that no one could, you couldn't build this thing with your little primitive tools. This requires architecture that doesn't exist on this earth. It has to come from, and I, and I agree with L.A. Marzulli on this point, and this is fallen angel technology, Nephilim architecture. And it somehow, it seems to always have these mounds, they seem to have moats. You've seen those moats, seen mounds? Well, this these mounds have these massive moats around it, water. And the water is used for what? No one knows. But it appears that water has this ability to become a gateway to the other, the other side or other realms. So water, as mentioned in our studies, appears to have a supernatural ability, and it does. And I've mentioned this before in our study. Our study, I think we were looking at the... The parable, oh, sorry, that's not the parable, the, the story, Luke 16. Luke 16, Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, spoke more on hell than any other preacher, any other writer in Scripture, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he speaks about an incident or an event where the rich man died and he went to hell and he was asking for water. It seems to me that water seems to have the ability to cross the realms and dimensions from a physical to the spiritual and back again. Water, it's just H2O. H2O, two, two atoms of uh, hydrogen, one atom oxygen. And it's just that substance. So, and it has that ability. So what is interesting is that water is also part of this entire uh, reading as we read it, that the Jordan being a body of water, being the sea, the Dead Sea or the Jordan Sea, the river itself, which we call a Jordan River, is part of that sea. So when it says that I stood upon the sand of the sea, it could possibly be that John was standing on the Jordan Sea and he saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads, ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. Now, this is just a, a deviation from our... The Dead Sea or the Sea of the Jordan may possibly be where Jordan is seeing this beast rise up out of the sea. Now, this is where one needs to utilize the tools of prophetic identification to determine what John is seeing. What John is seeing while in the spirit is a beast literally coming up out of the sea. However, 
its description is representative of some things that needs the scripture to decode and decipher. We need to decipher those things, and we'll do that tonight. But just on a side note, in our study back in January 2022, I don't know if you remember that far back, I did a study on hell and the resurrection as just a review of the scriptures. What is interesting about this is Matthew 12, 40. Have a look at this. And I've done this. You know, I think I showed you this. And as to whether or not you picked up on it, I'm just going to show you again. For as Jonas or Jonah, remember Jonah, the prophet Jonah? He was sent to Nineveh to warn them. Instead of going to Nineveh, he took off west. And I think he ended up in Tarshish, which is near Spain. I think today's Spain. So God calls him one way and Jonah, because he didn't have a, a love for fear for love for the people of Nineveh, he went the other way. And, you know, you can't run away from God. And here Jonah sleeping at the bottom of the boat and these pagan seafaring merchants, th there's a storm, God sends a storm, blows it all up. Remember the story? And I think they all start praying to their gods. And there's only one bloke that's not praying. And that's Jonah. He's, he's at the bottom having a sleep, having a snooze. That snooze first turns into this pleading of these pagan believing men who call out to John and says, you know, you need to pray to your God to calm the storm. And they think they draw, they draw some things, they draw sticks and who's who they're going to basically sacrifice someone to the sea because that's the God who these men clearly, they must have believed in, in these gods of Neptune, Baal, all these things that, that were gods of the sea. But what's interesting, Jonah then ends up, saying, look, you know, this is what I did. And the men on the boat basically said, why did you do that for? Now we're all in trouble. And Jonah just says, look, cast me in the water and you'll have peace and the sea will be calm. And they do. They cast Jonah into the sea. God is appeased and the whole sea is just instantaneously set at peace. And Jonah pretty much is just drowning all the way down to the bottom. And the Lord sends a great fish. Remember that story? I hope you remember that story. It's good to go re renew that kind of story. It's a story of faith and story of interesting proportions because Jonah died. And Jonah's spirit, his soul, popped out of his body. And Jonah's soul ended up going down to the mountains and the foundations of the earth. And what he saw was hell. What he saw was the great bars that stretch for eternity down the bottom. And then he cries out after three three days and three nights in the belly of the, the whale, which is also a euphemism for hell, as well as the literal belly of the whale. Jonah is pretty much brought back up and he's set back on land and breath comes into his body again. He's set up on land and he preaches to Nineveh. But here's the story. Here's the, the reference the Lord Jesus says. As for as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ didn't die on Good Friday because it just doesn't work. It doesn't work out the, the numbers. You're going to have to, I'll share with that later you know, on a, a diagram why the Lord Jesus, if we put our civil calendar, this is our Gregorian calendar we use. If we use our Gregorian calendar, the Lord Jesus did not die on Friday, on Good Friday. He actually died on Wednesday. And we'll work out that. I'll, I'll show you how it works out because it works out absolutely perfect according to the book of Mark. Mark chapter 11 all the way through is literally a sequence that you can read about the death, burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's straight on time. You can get that. However, going back to the story about jo Jonah, the Lord Jesus said this, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly, whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. I thought to myself, you know, when I was looking at the, the maps of old maps of Israel and the old maps of the Jordan, and this is the Jordan area, if you can see my, my cursor, all this area here. So draw a line, straight line. To the right is the Jordan. What is interesting about the Jordan today it used to be called the Trans Jordan. We've got a lot of trans stuff going on. This is called the Trans Jordan. Now it's called the Jordan Kingdom of Jordan. And on this side is Israel. But what I want you to have a look at is that when I was going through this, I had a look at the Dead Sea or the old Jordan Sea. What do you think it looks like? 
just uh, isolate that picture. What do you think it looks like? Looks like a whale, doesn't it? Looks like a whale. I always thought, hang on, what's the Lord talking about? It's got to be something because it looks to me like a whale. And when you realize that the Jordan is a highly charged area for where water or where it possibly, and you see in the Old Testament, that highly charged events take place where the portals are open, the gateways. This makes sense to me. And the Jordan Sea or the Dead Sea is in the shape of a whale. And where do you think the belly is? Well, it's right there. And what do you think in that peninsula used to be? That peninsula there, according to the maps, according to locations, that is the location of Sodom and Gomorrah. So I don't know if you remember that study we went through that. It was just of interest just to look at that and realize that the Jordan, Jordan, in our review from last week, has a lot of things going at the moment. So going back through that text, we go through that. In last week's presentation, is it not coincidental that the name Jordan is being touted and popularized again? And it is, given its comeback in 2020. 2020, when this bloke, this Satanist called Michael Jordan, his name was popular, repopularized, even though it was popular, but it was more, it was repopularized by the media, by the newspapers and by the internet in 2020. There was a release of a documentary that came out. I forget the name of the documentary. It could have been The Last Last Dance or something called, I'm not sure what it was called. However, it popularized his comeback and our interest, it was just after the death of Kobe Bryant, uh, all those things I could go through another talk about that but here it is it was popularized again popularized again given its comeback in 2020 hailed as the goat the goat that always they call them use the goat as an acronym of the greatest of all time but you, you can't be misleading you, you can't be ignorant that the goat there is the goat of men is this the the horn goat of satan himself michael jordan who blasphemously he blasphemously called himself black jesus gained resurgence and is the subject of Hollywood's latest idolatrous, idolatrous movie. And you see that. Air it's called. It's coming out. But isn't it interesting that the name Jordan is a resurgence of it? Could it be that the Jordan is a cryptic code for the emergence of the beast of Revelation 13 in, in the which the first seal is opened in heaven and the emergence of the man of sin emerges from the Jordan as he comes to a world that is crying out for peace and safety and is ready. I should have had there ready for a deliverer. Isn't that interesting? So again, the text, let's just break up the text. And here's the text about the beast that rises up out of the sea. This beast comes up out of the sea. Number one, it's deconstructed. It has seven heads, has 10 horns with 10 crowns. And upon his seven heads, the name of blasphemy. Consequently, this beast is essentially a chimera. It's a combination of everything, beasts. So uh, we could go again on another talk about chimeras and how prior to the flood of Noah's flood, you, you find this as we look around the world and all the evidence of chimeras being developed by the Nephilim, by the fallen and those who fell uh, to the earth and how they are creating these things, and you're seeing these come out, they're just degenerated. So, again, I want to bring this out again, that there are things we need to decipher. So just going back, we've got seven heads, ten horns with ten crowns, upon his heads the name of blasphemy. So that's very important to keep in, just in your memory bank there. But now let's have a look at these heads. So what these heads actually equal or what they are. The heads there also mean mountains. In this case, Revelation 17, comparing scripture with scripture, these are mountains or some cases in Revelation, they are leaders or principal chiefs. Okay, got to get that. In the next one, you've got 10 horns with 10 crowns. These are representative of kings or kingdoms. 
And the name of blasphemy, we know it's all on the heads, which is the mountains, the desecration, sacrilege, wickedness, and the profane against the Most High God. And so these heads have on them blasphemy, the names of blasphemy, and we're going to go through that as we just move along. What we'll do is we'll paint a simple picture, and then as we dig down, we'll then start putting th some things together of what the Scripture could possibly be, because I, let me just re reframe this, and I should say just bring us back to this truth, and the truth is this, from Revelation 4, the church is caught out before the seals are open. Revelation chapter 4 has this typology running that the church is caught out before the seals are open. The church of Jesus Christ, the body of Christ, is audience to the opening of the seals. So if we can get that in our mind, we realize that no one knows physically what the Antichrist looks like. He hasn't physically emerged. He hasn't physically been revealed. The revelation of the Antichrist comes when the Lord Jesus Christ opens that first seal. And so nowhere is now here is where we need to make a distinct description. And according to what I've just written here, the description of beasts and keep them clearly identified and divided where division needs to be done. So we don't get mixed up, confused and lost, for example. And this is where these beasts come in. OK, so you've seen this beast that we've looked at Revelation 13. Now I'm just going to give you examples of beasts in the Bible. So you've got this beast of Daniel chapter 8. It's a beast that represents uh, different powers. It's got a horn, and it's also got this narrative that goes along with it. Okay, very important that these horns represent powers. They represent kings, especially if there's a crown, and they represent a political, or I should say, a kingdom. So they're really important to, to notice that there are distinctions here. The next beast we notice that in Revelation, in, sorry, Daniel chapter seven. These beasts are described in Daniel 1, 1 to 28, as distinct and separate, one from the other. But the emphasis, however, is placed on the last beast, which is more diverse from all the others. I should have placed that. I've got a typo there. It says Daniel 1. It should have been Daniel chapter 7, not Daniel 1. It's Daniel chapter 7. We've been through these ones in our study of what's going on with Russia, England, all those things. We've gone through these studies. I might bring them back open again because we just want to make distinctions among all these beasts because you've got all these beasts running throughout the prophetic line and people would go, oh, well, what's that one? Is that the same as this one? There are distinctions, but there are similarities. All those things, we just need to decipher these things. Are these beasts connected with Revelation 13? Yes, they are, but with these distinctions. The description of Daniel, and this is these beasts here in Daniel chapter 7, all of these beasts come independently and individually out of the sea. They come out of the sea and they have a representation or a message or a description about them. And so the description in Daniel describes these beasts coming out of the great sea, not the sea as in Revelation. This is the great sea. Remember that Daniel at this time is in Persia, is in Iran, and that each beast has individual descriptions. However, with regard to the fourth beast, there was a fourth beast in Daniel 7. It's dreadful and terrible. It had 10 horns also, but it didn't have any crowns. So those are those distinctions. Whereas Revelation 13, it has 10 horns with 10 crowns. See, there's those distinctions. Uh, Revelation 12, and there appeared another wonder. We've been through this. Here is the description of Satan, Leviathan. Now, if you're going to break this name up, think about Leviathan. His name is Levi Athin. Levi means priest. He's a priest. And Athen comes from the Greek, which means eternal life. Or it comes also from <coughs> the name Jonathan. And Jonathan means God has given. So what is interesting is that Satan, Leviathan, he is a priest he is a king. He is exactly the counterfeit of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ in Hebrews is always pictured in Aaronic priesthood gear, which he is not. The Lord Jesus Christ is not after the priesthood of Aaron. He's after the priesthood of Melchizedek. He was Melchizedek. You've got to go to Genesis. Melchizedek was the priest king. He was the high priest unto the most high God. But he was a king and he was a priest. 
here we have Satan, Leviathan is his name in Job chapter 41. And he is not only a priest, but he's a king and he's eternal. It's, uh, all these things, just you can't make this kind of stuff up. You've got to study. The most powerful creature above all that God has created became the enemy, which is Satan, Shatan, of, in Hebrew, of God and mankind. Satan has seven heads, which has seven crowns and also has ten horns. Again, distinction must be made in respect between Satan's description and the beast of Revelation 13. And then we come to Revelation 13, and there's the second part of the, the chapter. So the first part we're looking at right now, here's the second part, or should say the third division. So you got the first division, which we're on right now. Then we've got that division, uh, verses 9 and 10. Now we've got this third division, which is 11 to 18, and it's all about this beast that comes up out of the earth, not out of the sea. That beast comes up out of the earth, being described in Revelation 11. It's also described in code in Revelation 17. This, again, needs to be divided as the beasts are distinct, but a part of a riddle. And there's a riddle in Revelation 17 that we'll decipher. Most have tried to do it, but I think, uh, again, as you study Revelation, we need to rightly divide the word of truth. And the Lord Jesus will literally, he will show us because if we come to the scriptures with a contrite heart, a humble spirit, wanting to be taught of the Lord, fearing the Lord, fearing his word, the Lord will bring it to our understanding. And there's some just amazing things that come out. And so we go back again. And I stood upon the sand of the sea. I saw the beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads, ten horns, and upon his horns, ten crowns, and upon his heads, the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw, and here we got this description now. We've got the, number two, verse two. This is verse two now. I'm going to verse two. I've just brushed over verse one, I'm just brushing it over. Now I'm just going to lightly brush on verse two. We're going to dig deep into these things. The beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. His feet was like as the feet of a bear, his mouth as the mouth of a lion. So the first part of this text is essentially that, Oh, sorry, in verse 2, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. That's the last part of that text. So the first part of that text, if I could go back, is that part there. He, it is likened unto a leopard. That's the main body. That is what the beast is, a leopard. But it has a feet of a bear, the mouth of a lion. And then the last part of that text, and the dragon gave him, this beast, his power and his seat and great authority, three things. It's a triple thing all, all, always. It seems to be triple here, three here, power, seat, great authority. What is interesting is that we've got to find out from the scripture, comparing scripture with scripture, just who may be Mr. X or the X-Man. And what can we glean from the word of God? What is his marks? X and the spot which where X is. They're all part of this entire study as we go along because there's some crazy things that go along with this in islamic literature the arrival here's the arrival as, I'm, as i remind you the coming of the antichrist is not new there's the narrative that's amongst islam islam has this thing going in their literature in islamic literature the arrival of dajjal and the mahdi will signal the end of days the coming of Coming one of Islam comes to restore order from the chaos that has penetrated the entire world. His arrival signals the era, new era of peace, which will be the new wave that rolls across the violent and disharmonious world. The golden age and era ensues uh, and the arrival of the Mahdi. Now, this is interesting. All of Islam is awaiting the arrival of this, this guy. And he arrives on a white horse. King James Bible announces the sixth seal open in heaven in chapter six of the 66th book of scripture. That's interesting. You've got to remember those numbers. The Antichrist or the rider on the white horse comes out in chapter six in the 66th book of the scripture, 666. The first rider rides on a white horse carrying a bow. He is a king and a conqueror sent forth, set forth to conquer him. Revelation 6, verses 1 to 2, And I saw when the Lamb opened up one of the seals, 
Again, we are audience there. The church is gone. The church is caught out. We are watching this. And when I saw the lamp open one of the seals, I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. We went through as we went through. We studied this as we looked at Revelation chapter 6. So again, the beast was like unto a leopard. And what is interesting about a leopard, just again, I'm doing little small brush strokes. Numbers 12, 1, and Miriam and Aaron spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. Now, historically, Ethiopia was always a kingdom. It had a dynasty of kings, queens, and royalty. It was only through the destruction of the Ethiopian economy and the kingdoms during the, the 2,000 years that we've been in we know that the history of the Church of Ethiopia, the history of the Kingdom of Ethiopia, was rich, rich in history, steeped in in the worship of, of God, steeped in the worship of Jehovah, and yet through the attacks made by Islam over the many centuries, you find that all these things starting to dwindle, the monarchy of Ethiopia started to die, its economy, and then you find that through the agencies of Rome, you find that this country, which holds what we call the Ethiopian church or the Coptic church, some of the last vestiges of the body of Christ and its truth and some of its uh, just amazing things, literature that comes out of here, was under attack during the 2,000 years of the church age. And Ethiopia was the focal point of that attack. And so we find that, you know, if you do the, the history, go have a look at Ethiopia under the rule that they did in during the 1980s. You find that it's been the absolute mission of the Vatican to starve the Christian church out of Ethiopia. And so you find all those things concerning uh, the live aid concerts, feed the world with USA for Africa, all these things are based on the nation of or the former kingdom, or the nation of Ethiopia. But here's Ethiopia, because Moses' wife, Moses' wife was Ethiopian. And Miriam and Aaron, literally, because they were Hebrews, which is interesting, they were pretty much, they had a, a racial discrimination against uh, Moses' wife. <laughs> that, that's just, to me, it's all, all plays into this whole narrative that's, that's now work through the entire world right now and it's all preparing the world for the coming if we could it quote unquote black jesus that's coming so we're going to, going to see that because all these things start to be placed in its uh, rightful uh, jigsaw puzzle so miriam and aaron they're upset at moses because he marries an ethiopian woman sephra who was the daughter of the high priest of uh, uh, Jethro. So Jethro was the high priest there in, in now what's the place? I can't remember. I'll remember off the top of my head. I'll try and find the scripture if you can find that for me. Find that Jethro is the high priest and you find that his oldest daughter is Sephra and she marries Moses. Now, the other text there, talking about this leopard is this text in jeremiah 13 23 can in the ethiopian change his skin well what's the color of the skin it's dark it's black can the ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots now i want you to really take a good look at the leopard the leopard spots are like lips just have a look at it they are like lips they're like Lips, mouth lips. Can a leopard change his spots? Then may you also do good that are accustomed to do evil. All the things that are in here have coded language because we're going to be we're, we're describing who this coming Antichrist, what he looks like. So he is possibly, according to the text. He is leopard, and he has dark skin. He's black skin. He has 
this whole thing. And in that leopard skin, there are what we call looks like lips. They look like lips. Let's keep looking. This beast also, because it was a likened unto a leopard, it had feet as it were of a bear. Those feet of a bear. You want to see the feet of a bear, you need to go look at communist Russia. And Russia hasn't changed. If you could put it that way, its feet are swift. And that feet is that Antichrist that's coming. Not only is he black in his color, not only does he have lips. That's a really interesting, those lips. I'm going to go through that. But he also moves like a Russian, like a communist. Very important. And the beast also had the mouth of a lion. So he moves like a communist. He's black in color. But he also speaks English. And I want to tell you this, that England is now paused on facing one of the greatest challenges in Christianity now. It's the last stronghold. England is now under attack in terms of the scriptures. The word of God is becoming so disintegrated there, the King James Bible, the home of the King James Bible. That's where the King James Bible finishes. It starts there. It will finish there. But the battle for the word of God is becoming more and more uh, decided uh, in England. I think uh, we have some of the brethren who have gone there and essentially they have stated that the last vestige or the last bastion of the King James Bible is now under attack and the hate literature because the King James Bible speaks truth. It speaks how it, how it, how it reads. If you're unsaved, you're going to hell. If you're living in sin, you're going to be going to hell if you're unsaved. All those things, there are, there are damnations and there are messages and word, the word of God, and it cuts through the whole world. The word of God is against the world. And those in England don't like that. They would rather have a translation that softens that and tickles their ears, all those things, but they do not want the King James Bible because it's full of hate. They identified that now as hate literature. That's in England. So the King James Bible looks like that the last bastion of the King James, where it started, 1611. It's where it all began. It's where it all, I should say, made its refining process, ended its refining process in England, because the King James Bible is the word of God to the English-speaking people of the world, which we are. This beast here speaks English. It's Antichrist. He's English-speaking. He is black in color. He moves like a communist, and he has a mark. That mark is identified also with an X, with lips, and we're going to see those things as we go through. And this dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. We went through this. It was interesting how the text reads, To the angel of the church of Pergamos write, These things saith he that hath the sharp sword with the two edges. And I went through that, that sharp sword. That's just interesting that that text has that. I know thy works where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. So I know thy works where thou dwellest. The church of Pergamos, at this point of time, and it will be in the future in the tribulation, those tribulation churches, but at this point of time during the, during the church age, Christians who dwelt in where he dwells. Now where he dwells, there's a comma, even, that's an additional, where Satan seed is. So he knows where the church dwells, and it dwelt in Pergamos. And you know what Pergamos was famous for? We went through this before in our study of churches. Pergamos was famous for the temple which gave place to their god that they worshipped. Asclepius was the serpent god. He was the god of pharmakia. But we get our word pharmacy, or witchcraft, all those things that go with medicine today. And that's the, the god that they worshipped, Asclepius. And that temple of Asclepius is where all the world came, not only to worship that serpent, Whatever went on in there, don't know, I don't know what it was, but what we're seeing is chimeras and just the most depraved and degenerate entities, higher entities maybe coming through there. I don't know. It was just the place where Christians had dwelt to preach the gospel. 
and they dwelt there. But the text says, even where Satan's seat is, because where Satan's seat is, is interesting because here is where Antipas, one of the faithful fathers, fathers of the church, was martyred and who was slain among you where Satan dwells. Now, what is interesting that Antipas was martyred in a place we call today Geneva. And Geneva, Switzerland, what's it most famous for? What is it most famous for? CERN. And CERN with its symbol of 666, with its occult festival of the opening, which is a real creepy and satanic opening. People weren't looking for it. You can go on YouTube and see that. But CERN with its 27-kilometer uh, Hadron Collider, where they're, they're, what they give to the public is that this is just the beaming particle lights where it cr clashes together after they speed it up. But what is happening is that they are opening portals, gateways. These gateways are gateways in which higher entities and entities have manifested themselves. And it's in this place where Antipas was the seat of Satan, Geneva, Switzerland. That is of interest. So those things kind of put that in your memory banks as you go through the we go through the scripture and go through this book as I'm just painting on just brush strokes right now. But first Thessalonians chapter five, verses one or two. But of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. In the tribulation, Daniel's seventieth week. The day of the Lord, that's the, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ with the armies of heaven on horses to rescue the remnant of Israel and to establish the reign of Jesus Christ on the earth for a thousand years through judgment and through cleaning up the whole mess that's on the earth. This is where we're heading towards in our study. And that is it for tonight, everyone. It is it. Any questions? I'll take those questions now.